March 2014, the Chinese government, the Chinese Ministry of Finance announced the intention to introduce a nationwide market in water pollution permits within three years. This regime aims to cut pollution levels and facilitate cross-regional water trading and pollution permits. The institution of a cap also seeks to encourage private sector investment in clean technologies. A non-tradable water pollution permit has been trialed in Upper Nanpan River since 1992. And a tradable water pollution permit system is present in Ningxia, Hu, and Inner Mongolia. The emergence of a megacity in Guangdong province, comprising 42 million people and a merger of nine cities, translates to increased industrial pollution. And it's in this context that a comparison between China and Hong Kong and the Maradonic Basin is water trading in the Maradonic Basin is relevant. The Chinese government and the government of Hong Kong SA are, may wish to consider a government environmental water buyback program present in the Maradonic Basin to improve the quality and quantity of water flowing from Guangdong into Hong Kong. So what are the main points of comparison? Hong Kong's water and Hong Kong's water concerns and that of the Maradonic Basin pertain to environmental flows. The delivery of environmental flows seek to remedy man-made disruptions to flow with the flow. Environmental flows concern the management and quanti of quantity, quality, and timing of water flows in river systems to maintain the health in the river of the river and interconnected groundwater systems for sustainable use. Hong Kong's water concerns and those of the Maradonic Basin are of a transboundary nature. Federal state tensions characterize the Maradonic Basin and are comparable to possible tensions which may arise by seeking to uni unify a water trade and governance regime between Hong Kong SAR and mainland China. Unlike China, water trading in the Maradonic Basin does not involve pollution permit trading, but trade of water quantities. Water consumption is capped and traded to improve water quality and quantity through per government purchases of water away from irrigated agriculture in the Maradine Basin toward, uh, toward the environment. The lessons pertaining to the limits of water trading as a method for reconfiguring water toward the environment, however, are equally applicable to all forms of water trading for the improvement of environment flows in Hong Kong, at the Pearl River Delta, and, and, and in other jurisdictions. So i quickly just mention the six lessons from the MDB, from the Maradine Basin, before uh, introducing the Maradine Basin and, and proceeding to discuss the issues in the Maradine Basin in detail. So, the first key lesson is that it's important when introducing a trading water trading regime to provide for environmental flows. That, mean, that means that there should be some special mechanism for protecting environmental flows because sometimes water trading can act to increase pollution. Government structures should be present to ensure that if the government is going to intervene to protect environmental flows by, by, through purchasing water for the environment, there should be a governance regime to ensure that the government secures actual returns of clean water for the environment, rather than wasting taxpayers' money. Governments need to comprehend the limits of water trade inherent in what is known as the endowment effect, which is a tendency for those who own property in water, or any property, to hold on to that property, which results in under-trading. It's important to comprehend the importance of timely, low water intensive transition economy planning. Where possible, if, where possible, centralization of management of the recovery of transboundary environmental flows will achieve benefits for the whole of the system. If you leave it in fragmented units for state by state, province by province, each province or each state tends to act in their own self-interest and you don't have environmental recovery for the whole of the system. 
It's very important to take qualitative and quantitative empirical work in a timely manner to understand which conflict resolution provisions are going to be effective in a transboundary water system. Um, and in this context, it's useful to look at the principles of customary international water law. The two Greek principles being equitable and reasonable utilization and no significant harm, which Patricia, uh, Professor Patricia Welch has mentioned this morning. So let me introduce the problems in the Maritime, Maritime Basin and the problems uh, in the Maritime Basin in the context of water trading. <coughs> the Maritime Basin is known as the food bowl of Australia, positioned in southeastern Australia. It is a transboundary river system extending across four states and one territory, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, South Australia, and the Australian Capital Territory. Over allocation of water rights to economic use by states has mimicked what is known as the tragedy of the commons, that is, where a property is commonly owned and there is overuse, leading, and this has occurred by over allocation of private rights, leading to ecosystem degradation. The Murray Basin is dominated by agriculture rather than industry, but environmental flow problems are similar and there are, there are slight differences, but in the envi environmental flow problem is an environmental flow problem. So being water quantity and quality issue. The water, so I, I made that last point already, that water was over allocated by separate state governments for economic use leading to economic environmental degradation. So here is the Murray Basin in southeastern Australia. The right. so constitutional power is granted to the states for the management of water between 1901 and 2001. State powers were referred to the federal government as le only as late as 2007-08 by legislation under the Constitution due to increasing environmental degradation, which was not being managed properly by states. Environmental problems include reduction in biodiversity, rising algal blooms, compounding, salinization, irrigated and direct areas, water logging, floodplain harvesting, adversely impacting ground and surface water and acid sulfate soils, which are exacerbated. These environmental problems are exacerbated by drought recurring drought, which is a part of a natural cycle exacerbated by climate change. So in 1997, uh, all states of the Maritime Basin and the federal government introduced what's called the cap and trade system, where water extraction was capped at 1993-94 levels. However, water trading increased the level of environmental degradation due to the activation of what, is, what are called sleeper and dozer licenses. So sleeper, sleeper licenses are those which were previously unused but owned, and dozer licenses were those which were partially used on entitlement. So these licenses were activated. They weren't uh, regulated to prevent their activation, which was a major problem. And at that time, there was no provision for an environmental buyback program. So what, the introduction of the cap and trade system actually increased the, the amount of um, irrigation activity and increased the amount of like, environmental degradation, which led to the introduction of the National Water Initiative in 2004. Under this program, a buyback scheme for the environment was introduced. So government water purchases were, were advocated a $500 million Australian dollar uh, program was established to recover 500 gigalitres between June 2004 and June 2009. So what happened during this period, by the time June 2009 arrived, recovery for the water for the environment was below target. And there were a large number of what we call paper water purchases uh, on the register. So what does that mean? What's a paper water purchase? It means that you buy a purchase you buy an entitlement, but it's a particular security of environment an entitlement called the, 
called general security as opposed to high security, which means during dry periods, less water, you're entitled to less water against your entitlement. So during prolonged drought periods, high security entitlements were recovering 80 to 95 percent of the entitlement, whereas general security entitlements were recovering somewhere between 0 to 30 and as often 0. So a lot of the general security entitlements were purchased by government, and there was no governance regime to prevent the government from making those purchases. So those paper water purchases are a long-term problem in the context of recurrent man-made droughts exacerbated by climate change. So the Water Act 2007 transferred central management power from water resources to the MDP, over the MDP to the federal government. In 2007-08, a $3.1 billion fund was established for the government water buyback program. As time progressed between 2007 and 2010 and thereafter, significant resistance to the setting of sustainable diversion limits emerged in the irrigation community, particularly in 2010 with the, result, with the release of the guide to the basin plan, which was to be issued under the Water Act 2007. Uh, protests including, included burnings of the guide to the basin plan by irrigation communities. A 2,750, that should read 2,750, kilolitre annual return target was set. Uh, the initial limit on buybacks was then set. By the time 2013 arrived, uh, state governments and federal governments negotiated a limit on bu buybacks, government buybacks, at 1,500 gigalitres, the rest to be returned by infrastructure water savings. This was then reduced again to 1,300 gigalitres. Uh, at December 2013, only 1,138 gigalitres have been purchased, and with a large proportion being general security entitlements. So that's a photograph of one of the protests. So the key question is, what are the limits of the water by that program? Why was there so much resistance in the irrigation community and by states? To explain that, a qualitative survey of 41 irrigators was triangulated across four regions of the Maranao Basin. was triangulated with documentary analysis, comparative analysis of an American study, uh, and viewed through the lens of new institutional economics to validate the results. The study further examined uh, the Water Act 2007 and looked at international water law uh, investigating irrigator mental models with respect to the, the conflict. But that's not covered here because it's not directly relevant today to the question of water trade, the limitations of water trade. But I will return to that at the very end. Okay, so very quickly, uh, on new, new institutional economics is a theory of institutions which incorporates law, rules, customs, and norms into econ economics, extended, extended neoclassical economic theory. While new institutional economics retains the assumptions of scarcity, perfect competition, and perfect competition, the assumptions of rationality and perfect information and zero transaction costs central to neoclassical economics are abandoned to better reflect reality. So one of the key questions posed by one of the founders of New Institutional Economics, Douglas North, is how do institutions impact economic growth? So here we're looking at the market as an institution for determining growth in the context of sustainable development. So sustainable economic development as growth. Bounded rationality was, is key to the study of New Institutional Economics and this study. Which means, bounded rationality means that mental capacities can be limited, but we're not always perfectly rational in the market. Our analysis is shaped by our, our individual experiences. And limited information also contributes to binding our rationality. Binding our rationality. All right. So, in exploring bounded rationality in the Murray Basin, three limits, three key limits of 
the water by that government water by that program of fund. The endowment effect, central concern for the rural economy, and the free rider effect, which was tied to both the endowment effect and central concern for the rural economy. Uh, central concern for the rural economy implied the need for transition economy planning, which was absent in the water law. So the endowment effect is as Thaler 1980 described, a state where an owner's willingness to accept payment as compensation for property already owned exceeds willingness, willingness to pay to acquire that same property by a substantial amount. As a consequence of increased value given to the same property by a, uh, by a substantial amount. As a consequence of sorry, as a consequence of increased value given to property owned. There is a tendency for the owner to hold on to the property. The majority of irrigators surveyed across four regions of the NDP intended to hold on to their water entitlements rather than participate in the environmental buyback. The decision-making pattern can be in part attributed to the endowment effect. There are four reasons for, in the theory, for the emergence of the endowment effect. The first, as Kahneman Nation Thaler observed, is caused by the absence of substitute goods. The second and third, as Kahneman and Sversky in 1979 articulated, pertain to prospect theory, which articulates the presence of what is called loss aversion and status quo bias. Loss aversion occurs where this, this, there is psychological pain attached to losing something, and that, is, that pain is so great that there's a pre preference for providing avoiding losses over taking the risk of acquiring gains. Status quo bias is a tendency to maintain the same position as arising as a consequence of, the, of loss aversion. So the second and third factors are connected. Fourthly, Hoffman and Spitzer identify sentimental attachment as a cause of the endowment effect when property becomes bound to personality. So the presence of Strong resistance. One, one moment. The press, sorry, that's correct. The presence of strong resistance by irrigators in the Murray Darling Basin to the water buyback and the reasons they gave for this resistance provides evidence of the endowment effect. Water is a key farm input for which there is no sub substitute, so that that work part was easy to uh, prove, and its value heightened in drought periods. High profitability of irrigated farm businesses, valuation of water as an integral farm asset, tertiary training in ir irrigated agriculture, low of farm income, and the intention to use water entitlements as a retirement asset led to loss aversion and st status quo bias. How would that translate to Guangdong province and Hong Kong? Well, while, businesses, while there is more industrial production than agriculture in Guangdong province and Hong Kong, um, you'll see that the, the factors which may lead to an endowment effect are, would be similar. The appreciation of lifestyle benefits and emotional attachment to irrigated agriculture and fa family tradition of irrigated agriculture demonstrated the presence of sentimentality. Uh, so sentimentality can be present for any business activity. So all four theoretical causes of the endowment effect were found in a Maradona basis. The findings of this study also confirmed results of an earlier study in 1998 by Ize and Sinding uh, in the La Hotan Valley, Nevada, which articulated this in the similar factors outlined previously as impediment, impediments to willingness to sell to a government water buyback program for the environment. Without, act, but that study by Ize and Sinding. Uh, didn't identify the endowment effect and didn't discuss the theory of the endowment effect. Okay, so the next factor is the transition economy strategy. So in the qualitative survey conducted, irrigators was asked a hypothetical question as to whether to consider a hypothetical decision to sell where offer prices made by government and irrigators were equal. And in that context, they stated they would prefer to sell to other irrigators to maintain the, the rural economy. That is, um, there, there is a tendency to undertrade towards government buyers to preserve the rural economy. 
And I'll quickly run through this point without um, proceeding into too much detail. But much of the resistance to the water buyback program pertains to taking water out of irrigated, the irrigated agriculture economy. And there is nothing in the Water Act 2007 which reassures the community it's intended to balance economic, environmental, and social outcomes. But there's nothing in the Water Act that reassures the community, reassures rural communities that the government is making, has any investment strategy, any plans for the future of the rural economy so that farmers can easily transition into a new economy. And this has been a big mistake. It's a fundamental flaw in the Water Act. It's as fundamental as leaving um, drinking water needs for humans out of the Water Act in the first draft, which was done. So it's, I think leaving uh, transition economies, investment strategies, is, is that, it's that much of a fundamental flaw. And it's driving conflict in the Maritime Basin. The third point, the free rider effect, is uh, commonly understood. So the free ride problem is the tendency for individuals to gain benefit from consumption of a publicly provided good. In this case, environmental flows without contributing to the maintenance and payment of benefit. So most irrigators in the study appreciated the need for environmental protection, but they didn't they weren't making plans to participate in the government purchase program. They were hoping that other farmers would participate. And so the free rider effect was uh, exacerbated by the endowment effect. And is also the endowment effect and the free rider effect are also tied to the central concern for the rural economy. So in conclusion, there are, uh, there are six key lessons for Hong Kong from the NTV. So the first lesson is that it's important for a government scheme to, it's important to consider a government scheme for buying back water for, for the environment at the time that a cap-and-trade system is instituted. Because the mere institution of a cap-and-trade system does not always protect the environment. Uh, if sleeper and doser licenses can be identified in a water pollution permit trading system in Hong Kong and mainland China, and it's important to decide how you're going to regulate those particular entitlements to ensure that industrial pollution doesn't increase through the institution of cap and trade system. Lesson number two, government systems for ensuring government water purchases. Government systems should be in place for ensuring that government water purchases deliver actual returns to the environment. In the Maritime Day Basin, the majority of purchases on the government registered to 2013 under various buyback programs are general security rather than high security. Large volumes of general security entitlements means there's a possibility of limited or no returns to, entitlement, to, the, to water entitlements uh, of great concern to ecosystem resilience during prolonged drought periods. A strong regulatory framework and for government purchases for the environment prevents expensive waste of valuable taxpayers' money. And this continues to be missing in the Maritime Basin. It's important for government to comprehend the endowment effect which heightens the free rider effect. This involves engagement in dialogue with the business community and strategizing to impact, to reduce impact through transition economy planning. So it's important to take surveys, qualitative and quantitative surveys, and understand the degree and scope of the endowment effect from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And that will shape, uh, that, that will in part shape transition economy planning. The fourth lesson is uh, that government transition economy economic forward planning is very important in order to secure participation in a government uh, by that program for the environment. So, as mentioned previously, transition economy planning is central to address the endowment effect and the free rider effect. 
A qualitative and documentary analysis in the Maradine Basin demonstrates that the creation of alternative economic futures, which involve low levels of water pollution and extraction, is essential for securing successful trading of water towards the environment. It's recommended that the transition economy planning be embedded in water law, such that the two paths, the environmental path and sustainable uh, environmental path and the industrial development, reinforce each other to achieve sustainable economic development. The absence of a transition economy plan gave rise to significant conflict in the Maritime Basin, particularly in 2010, which is, and is ongoing in 2014. The qualitative and documentary analysis in the Maradona Basin also demonstrate that socio-economic transition planning holds the potential to reduce conflict. As many irrigators indicated that they would be interested and willing to participate in transition programs. Centralized governance for environmental protection where possible is important. And this is simply as mentioned earlier the fact that individual states and provinces have a tendency to act in their self-interest. So where you have a good central government, um, then capable a good and capable central government, there will be hopefully an, an appropriate balance of environmental, social and economic interests of benefit to the whole transboundary water system. The last point is that Timely empirical research to develop adequate conflict resolution provisions is important and they, are, they should be embedded in the water law. The Water Act 2007 governing Mother Maritime Basin held, held inadequate conflict resolution provisions further exacerbating tension. The conflict mo resolution model developed for the Maritime Basin in my research may not precisely suit the needs of Hong Kong SAR and Guangdong province. This is a key area for future research with regard to Hong Kong's environmental water requirements. It is necessary to undertake the necessary empirical, it is necessary to undertake the required empirical work to build effective conflict resolution provisions embedded in the water law, building on the, in, the existing international customary water law principles with a focus on the no significant harm rule recommended. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.